Hello. My name is Robert Adam. I'm an assistant professor at Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh. Previously, I worked at DECAL at UCL uh, for 12 years, where I was a research assistant before becoming the director of continuing professional development courses with teaching and other responsibilities. My research interests are multilingualism, bilingualism, minority sign language communities, and deaf interpreters. The reason I'm interested in researching ghostwriting in my paper is because I grew up as a child language broker. So that meant that I was brokering language for my parents and those other people in the deaf community. And my parents both come from different sign language backgrounds. My father is an Auslan, Australian sign language user, and my mother an Australian Irish sign language user, AISL. So I saw both those language varieties, and an example of brokering would have been when I needed a sick note for school. I would write the note, I would give it to my mother to copy and sign, and then I would hand it in at school. So I have this experience of writing what I saw my parents saying. So that was my experience as a child, and I'm interested to know if other people have the same experience or not. Also, I know that sign language interpreters become interpreters, either through being friends with deaf people, or they may work with deaf people, and they learn sign language, and they train to become interpreters. Or some people just join uh, a program to train as interpreters and learn sign language that way. But we haven't had that conversation really amongst deaf people about how deaf people become interpreters or translators. And I'd like to find more about that, their progression route. Um, how does it start? What experience do they get? So there's information we know about hearing people who are interpreters. But what about those deaf people who come from within the community? I'm interested to find out more. So we find out more through doing research into people's experiences and what they do in practice. And three of us are working together on this. Myself, Christopher Stone, and Breda Carty. Christopher is hearing, Breda is deaf, and the three of us have decided that we would like to interview deaf people, and we would like to know what their experience is. And it's their experience as ghostwriters that we'd like to learn more about. So why did we choose to call it ghostwriting? Because I remember when I was young, I would see in the deaf club that there were people who were deaf there who had good written English skills and others who didn't. And they'd say, well, that's because it's been ghostwritten. And I remember that term. So that's why we've chosen it. So what we want to know is people's experience, how they started to do ghostwriting, what they do as ghostwriters. And we'll do that by interviewing people. We're interviewing deaf people in Australia and also the UK. And we're balancing for gender, so an equal number of men and women. We'd also like to have had a greater diversity of racial and ethnic diversity. Unfortunately, at the time, everybody in Jude was white. But it would be interesting now, subsequently, to see what happens within deaf minority communities, those non-white communities in the deaf population. How do they support each other as translators, interpreters, and language brokers? So in our interviews, we wanted to find out how did people begin doing this? And what we found out really comes down to two main points. Firstly, most of them started doing this at a deaf school. This is because many school teachers didn't understand certain pupils and another pupil would tell the teacher what that other deaf pupil had said or in reverse, the pupil didn't understand the teacher and another pupil would say what the teacher had said. Likewise with the written word, um, uh, one pupil writing letters for another to copy before sending. So we have a number of examples of where this begins in deaf schools and becomes a very embedded practice and is a valuable form of mutual support with language and translation amongst deaf people. The second examples come from the deaf club, where different people bring different skills. 
For example, there may be someone who's a good needleworker, another who's a good carpenter, another who's a good mechanic, and someone who's good with written English. And people are asked to help each other and use their different skills in exchange. So I grew up knowing who in the deaf community had good written English, and I knew who deaf people were going to to ask for help with written English. If they didn't understand something that was written, they would ask for an explanation from somebody else. To give their reply, they would sign their reply, and that person would write it down for them. On other occasions, I remember if somebody had an important appointment, they would ask another deaf person to go with them to that appointment and to work together, uh, communicating maybe by gesture, to support that appointment and find various strategies to help with communication. So deaf people were finding resourceful ways to work with English amongst themselves whether that was spoken English or the written word. The impact here is to help us understand how deaf interpreters and translators and language brokers learn those skills. Where do they come from? We know for hearing people and those that become interpreters, there are professional associations, there are registers for those people, there is a history. But for deaf people, it is unknown. It happens, but we would like to know from within the community, how does it occur and the value put on it? So we'd like to compare the two. For those deaf interpreters and translators, they have a hidden history and one that isn't openly talked about. There are also other studies that have found that in the 16th and 17th century, deaf people were going to court as under the Napoleonic Code, it was stated that they must have a deaf interpreter in the court. And there are examples of this. However, people do not know this. People do not know that deaf interpreters have played a part in history. These findings need to be made more visible and learnings taken from them with an impact on training, knowledge and skills exchange.